Great, perfect. Thank you so much. My name is Steve Klaus. Um, I'm Migratory Shorebird Program Manager with BirdLife Australia. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the Directory of Important Migratory Shorebird Habitat in Australia, a project that we've been pursuing over the past three years. Um, translating surveys into a conservation action is sort of the subtitle that I've given the talk, um, because it's not purely going to be a scientific talk, but it's also going to have a strong implementation component in it. So Australia is at the southern end of the East Asian Australasian flyway. We have 37 species of migratory shorebirds, um, one from New Zealand um, that come down to us from the Arctic breeding grounds regularly. Um, and as such, Australia, of course, has an um, outstanding importance um, for the entire flyway as the final destination. Now, one of the key questions when we're talking migratory shorebirds and monitoring is always, where are the birds? Um, in Australia, we um, have a long history of shorebird counting. Um, however, until about the 1970s, shorebird counting has only been very sporadic. So there were some sites, some people take care of those sites, monitoring birds, um, but it was not organized um, in any sort of centralized manner. The Australian government then funded a survey effort uh, in the 80s, from 1981 to 1985. Um, so around Australia, the idea was um, people should go out in a more concerted effort, um, try and gather some numbers and see where the birds were actually roosting. Um, that was followed by a period of volunteer counting um, in 1986 um, to 2004. Um, that, was a time, that was a time when government funding um, had been pulled, but the uh, monitoring yeah. still um, continued. We then uh, moved into a period uh, where under BirdLife's coordination, um, the National Shorebird Monitoring started. The National Shorebird Monitoring um, came out of these previous efforts, um, about 520 areas um, with 2,800 um, 2, um, count areas, um, two annual core counts. So uh, a winter and summer count during a set time window, people across Australia would go out and um, count birds. Um, with about 1,400 volunteers um, and a coverage of um, 58 species. So here was the first time that in, in a very um, structured um, manner, um, in a coordinated effort, um, birds were being counted. And you can see here on the map um, a bit of an impression of what coverage looked like. Um, southeastern Australia, the coastline being considerably better covered um, than most of the inland areas, a very low population density. However, for some of the areas like 80 Mile Beach here um, shown, um, it was really nice to see um, what species, what numbers we would have at those sites. What the long-term count data show us, and Rich is gonna recognize um, some of these graphs, um, has been quite clear for some time. Um, I've picked out one of the threatened species we have in Australia, the Curl of Sandpiper. We have a long-term data series, spatially very comprehensive, and university modeling here by UQ has shown um, quite conclusively that there has been a long going decline um, that um, eventually has led to substantial population reduction. And of course, the basis of understanding these things is always um, a comprehensive monitoring effort. So our path to action in Australia for more shorebird conservation um, has come about um, from um, around 2007 with our national shorebird monitoring taking off um, then the Australian government in 2015 um, put in place the Wildlife Conservation Plan for Migratory Shorebirds that set out some of the objectives for conservation. And about two years later, that plan was operationalized by a Migratory Shorebird Conservation Action Plan that is being coordinated by BirdLife Australia and has key stakeholders among those, um, the federal government and state governments in it. And that plan, the action plan outlines some of the actions to be taken around Australia um, to improve migratory shorebird conservation. This wildlife conservation plan for migratory shorebirds um, follows the flyby vision, ecologically sustainable populations of migratory shorebirds remain distributed across their range and diversity of habitats in Australia um, and throughout the flyway. The four key objectives of the plan are presented here, protection of important habitats, um, wetland habitats are protected and conserved, anthropogenic threats um, are minimized or eliminated, and final knowledge gaps in migratory shorebird ecology are identified and addressed um, to inform decision makers, land managers, and the public. And very important on that one, um, because the national directory was identified as a priority objective. 
It was adopted in this uh, Migratory Shoreway Conservation Action Plan, and it is underpinned by a recent revision of the flyway population estimates that was done in 2017, um, led by BirdLife. The last review of important sites um, was done in 2008 by Bamford Watkins and others. Um, they used on flyway population estimates, focused mostly on international significant sites, um, and some of the data came back um, as far as the 70s. Um, of course, the data was in, in no way um, coordinated for the most part, so it wasn't a concerted effort that had a standardized uh, monitoring scheme behind it, um, but it identified 118 sites of international significance. Um, and the interpretation was in parts because of the vast two different methodologies behind it, quite difficult. So what is the purpose of our national directory? Um, first of all, it's a robust scientific basis for the uh, government to make decisions and target, and target investments um, and also set conservation priorities. That is the, the, the most important um, purpose um, of this effort. Um, it also contributes to practical on the ground delivery of threatened species strategies by targeting um, certain bird species um, and then guides monitoring and conservation. Um, so you can identify gaps, you can target investments um, into community engagement, education capacity building and increase efforts um, for conservation at key shoreward sites. So that is definitely one of those things that I'm going to be talking about a little more. What were the criteria for inclusion of sites in our directory? Um, important habitat are all those sites recognized as significant. This is what the national legislation in Australia says. And the international and national significance criteria of more than 1% of the flyby population for international or 0.1% of the flyby population for national significance were adhered to. So this is the, the framework how we identified which sites were important and whether there were significant numbers, birds, the data sources used were um, bird data. Um, we also used a range of other um, data sources, Aramea birds, um, predecessor of eBirds, then eBird data, um, a range of consultant reports and other sources, anything basically that we had on, on shorebirds populations in Australia within a time book window from 2005 to roughly 2017. Um, so it aligns with the most recent population um, estimates review um, and we have the data um, over the past decade or so that represents the most recent available data for our effort. Um, the directory um, has two dimensions, um, the data are presented in. One is the sites, so we identify um, so-called site accounts for significant sites around Australia. And here you can see um, a general characterization of the site, what is land tenure, what is the geographic region, uh, what is the extent of the site, um, there's a general site description in the directory, and then you can see the actual counts, so you can actually see that, for instance, for red extinct, it tells you exactly what the thresholds of significance are, what the maximum counts were um, during that data period that we're looking at, what date, the number of surveys, and the actual sources. So it is really scientifically sourcing um, the data and, and showing for the specific site, what species, what numbers, all those details. Um, the site accounts then also come with a comprehensive um, mapping um, to actually so, show on satellite images what's the extent and location of the site uh, for reference, so decision makers can easily access that information. The other dimension that we have in the directory um, are the species accounts, so we look at specific species. The red extinct has been picked out here, and again you can see um, what are the uh, significant, significant significance thresholds um, what are the, uh, the state um, um, conservation listings, um, general characterization of the species, uh, where it is found in Australia, and then a list of the sites. So we actually have the individually numbered sites here, um, the name of the site, the state, maximum count number encountered. So for uh, Red Lake Stint, there was site number 168, 80 Mile Beach in Western Australia, with a maximum count in 2009 of more than 33,000 birds. So that then gives you a bit of an impression of um, uh, what sites are important for that species. Um, that can be translated into maps, so we can actually uh, produce something like this that shows all the um, internationally and nationally significant sites around Australia for that particular species, for the sites that we had data for, 
Um, so of those 522 sites that I've um, shown you earlier, we had data for around 379 after combining all our databases. So there's pretty good coverage. Here's another example of a sharp-tailed sandpiper. Um, you can see the difference in usage of, of areas, although they're mostly along the coast, we can see these archaeological um, components in our data set as well. Um, finally, the outcome has been um, the National Directory. This is the um, a map of Australia showing um, all internationally and nationally important shorebird areas. Uh, we have 151 internationally significant areas identified, um, 282 nationally significant. Um, that is an up from the last um, from the last um, um, review that was done in 2008, um, and that is predominantly also because of the monitoring efforts. So Im improved data um, have um, allowed us to um, improve the identification of sites. What are the conservation implications? Um, as you can see here, we then have the opportunity um, to um, rank areas. So things like how many years of data do we have? What was the last year of a survey done? Um, what is the species richness? Um, is the site significant um, on the different dimensions? Um, and we can pick all these things out and use them in the directory to rank sites and uh, determine conservation priority areas. And that is then uh, the basis for engaging stakeholders and communities uh, to develop something that is called the Site Action Plan. Um, this is a bird life format that we have developed over the past two years. Um, and of course, at the same time, we're still trying to improve shorebird monitoring and conservation participation and outcomes. So to get more people to sites that are important, um, this is also very um, much a key uh, prerequisite for. Um, the directory then also enables us to tag action specifically to key species. So we can target um, species such as the Far Eastern Curlew um, by um, prioritizing, assessing threats at those sites that are most important to the species um, and then develop management recommendations. So it is really about getting um, action to those species um, that are under threat the most. At the same time, it enables us not only to look at threatened species, but also at key sites around Australia. I've already mentioned the site action plans, and this is something that BirdLife is currently um, working on um, with our partners. So the site action plan idea is that we fine tune existing management plans for selected sites. Um, it's a local stakeholder process. We try and get everyone around the table who has stakes in the site, um, and then fast track high impact actions to um, improve protection of the site, and ultimately, um, give ownership of these plants um, to the communities that are local. You can see on the map already these um, gray dots along the coastline. Those are the areas that we currently have site action plans in, namely Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales. The site action um, planning process is a very involved process. Um, it really is finding out who local stakeholders for sure that site are, what are the key threats in that area, how can they be mitigated, what actions have the most impact, who will carry those out, what indicators are we using. So it's a flock exercise, but everyone's involvement around a site is needed. What's next? Um, the directory um, I've been talking about um, is currently with the Australian government. Uh, we delivered it as a contract work in August 2019. Um, we finalized it after extensive um, consultations with the states and territories um, in May 2020. So by then, all the stakeholders around Australia, conservation organizations, researchers, everyone had their input. And it's got about 1,400 pages and is the most comp comprehensive analysis of monitoring data in Australia to date. For the site action plans that I've touched upon, um, about 20 have been developed with our funding partners to date. Um, those in South Australia and New South Wales um, are now finalized and they are entering the implementation phase. So the actions in those plans are starting to be now implemented. It has the potential to be rolled out nationwide for key sites that we have identified in the directory um, and also internationally. So very happy to advise international partners on how to um, do site action planning processes um, at the local site. And of course, the wildlife conservation plan for migratory shorebirds will be revised later this year, early next year, um, and our action plan will follow put. So we're going to be able to use this directory information to directly um, input it into policy decision making. Um, all this would have not been possible without our partners. So I would like to extend um, 
a huge thank you to all the volunteers and the partners that we've had in the process of doing the national shorebird monitoring um, and developing this um, new approach of site action plans. Um, we have so far been focusing on sites where we had funding for, but of course there's many more sites that around Australia need attention. If you want to find out more about the site action planning process in Zoom room number one in about 45 minutes, my colleague Marta Ferenczi is going to give a talk on site action planning in Australia. So how exactly are those plans done? You can also visit our website, get in touch with me anytime. Um, as I said, we're very happy and we see huge potential for this standardized approach of site action planning um, to be rolled out across other countries in the flyway.